Hallelujah. Cancer free. Baruch Hashem. You know, God's good. And um, uh, the things, the truths that we talk about and read about in the Word are real. And, you know, it's for us to uh, receive them, to engage God, to seek after Him, and, and God um, is faithful. So, with that said, I want to thank uh, the um, leadership team for covering for us for a few weeks while we were gone. Um, everyone in the leadership, Rena, Evan, the whole board, the worship team, everyone that helped while we were gone, we really appreciate it. It was nice to have a few weeks off, but it's like any vacation, it's nice to go, but it's nice to come back. So with that said, we want to say thank you. We missed you guys. And I trust that we have a word from the Lord for us here um, this morning. So why don't you um, pray with me? Avinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to perceive, and the will to obey your word that I hear today in Yeshua's name. So last week we began a new series entitled 2020 Vision. And Rena asked the question, what can you see? In the message, she discussed the visual impairments that keep us from clear spiritual vision, such as pain, grief, and sorrow. She talked about this scripture that mentions having a plank in your eye, which obviously impairs our vision, and likened it to issues of sin, like pride, unforgiveness, and holding on to offense. Perhaps we are too far away to see clearly, intimating that our relationship with God perhaps is distant, and we need to close that gap. She went on to give the solution, which is to run to God for healing and allow him to remove any planks as we deal with any issues that are in our life. This week, I'm going to talk about living with your new vision. We're in a new year, at least calendar year. And God wants to do new things, right? He says, forget what is behind, right? And press forward uh, towards the new things that he has for you. The truth is you can't change the past anyway, but you can move forward in the new vision that God has for you, your life, and your family. And um, I'm going to be talking about living with that new vision since there is often an adjustment period and a few challenges as you get a custom to your new improved eyesight, certainly in the natural, and it's true in the spirit as well. Um, we're talking about spiritual vision today, but we're using natural eyesight for an analogy. And if you can see here, um, this one's nice and clear. I was just recently at the eye doctor, and without the glasses, boy, it was just like this. <laughs> and then when you put those lenses on, I was like, wow, that's really good. It's better and better. And yeah, I can see great when I had the right prescription. And so it's great to have good, clear vision, correct? And so we are in the spirit, and spiritually speaking, we want to have the same thing as well. So there's an adjustment period. For instance, you might experience a number of issues with your vision during this period where you're getting used to your glasses. And I'll give you a testimony, because it certainly happened to me, for sure. Some of these include eye strain in the first uh, days that you wear new glasses. Distortion might occur as different aspects of your vision might change slightly while you are adjusting to new glasses, depending how far away an object is. The fishbowl effect, where the image may seem bent on the edges, but the center is clear. And all those things, when you get new glasses, you don't expect that, right? You expect it, right? Everything should be uh, perfect. You might struggle with depth perception and find it hard to discern how far away or close something is. And that's troubling. Um, you might initially struggle with frequent headaches, uh, which is common and normal. And the same is true as we orientate to a new, improved spiritual perspective. Often people say, well, Rabbi, you know, I did what you said. I'm praying, I'm being faithful, I'm giving, I'm worshiping, and it seems like all hell is breaking loose against me. Now, if you could handle this, here's the truth. That's not a bad thing. 
<laughs> and you say, why is that a bad thing? Because, you know, Hasatan is not bothering people who aren't doing anything. If you're already walking down his path, he's going to let you keep going. But if you're doing something for him, sure he's going to harass you and harangue you and bother you and get you upset, mess with your stuff like he did with Job, right? So um, it often means you're doing something right. And so the same is true with our natural vision and with our spiritual, the spiritual vision that God gives. There is an adjustment period till you adjust to what exactly is going on. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we read this. They continued faithfully in the teaching of the emissaries, in fellowship, in breaking bread, and in the prayers. Everyone was filled with awe, and many miracles and signs took place through the emissaries. All those trusting in Yeshua stayed together and had everything in common. In fact, they sold their property and possessions and distributed the proceeds to all who were in need. Continuing faithfully and with singleness of purpose to meet in the temple courts, courts daily and breaking bread in their several homes. They shared their food in joy and simplicity of heart, praising God and having the respect of all the people. And day after day, the Lord kept adding to them those who were being saved. We need to realize that the passage I just read was a new paradigm for the people who were there, as well as for the shuliachim, for the apostles. This was a totally new paradigm, and they were not used to it. And today I'm going to talk about preparing ourselves to successfully live with our new vision, and the first thing is commitment. Turn to your neighbor and say commitment. Transition is often hard, any transition. How many people love change? Let me see your hands. Isn't that funny? We don't like change. And the reason we don't like change, let me tell you why I don't like change. Because once I know there's a change coming, I know that everything has to get revamped. And that means for a while, my life is going to be more complicated. I have to, there's a learning curve when change begins to happen. And that means more effort on my part. I might be uh, perhaps uncomfortable for, for a season as I enter into that transition period. So the natural thing is to say, you know what, don't change. Just keep it the same and everything is good. But it's interesting that that's not how God works. God loves change because he wants to bring growth into our lives. So I remember when I got my glasses for the first time. First of all, like most people, I put it off way too long. And, you know, I was squinting, reading like this, really struggling. You know, I'm not, I'm not getting glasses. No way. My, my, my distance wasn't too bad at that point, so I was just squinting. I was just rough it through. But then it got more and more frustrating because you can't read, not even the Bible. And to be honest with you, my arms weren't long enough anymore. <laughs> I just ran out of, that's it. I can't get it any farther away. And so let me go ahead and go to the doctor and see what he has to say. And I went, and of course, I needed glasses, and thus I have them. And I thought that that would solve all of my problems. And then I found some wonky things happening, like when I'm going down the stairs and my progressives, we're going to, oh my gosh, am I going to hit the right step? And you start to get wonky. When you're driving at night, the reflections, and am I seeing the car? What am I seeing? And it gets, and the peripheral vision, everything is thrown off. And let me tell you, I was tempted to say, you know what the heck with the glasses? I don't mind squinting. My distance vision isn't terrible. And the truth is, for the longest time, I did not wear my glasses in the house, except for when I had to read. So I would come home and I'd put the glasses on the, on the you know, kitchen table and leave them there. And then when I, when I went back to the um, eye doctor, he said, I want you to wear the glasses all the time. I said, Doc, I have a big TV in the house. I don't need glasses to watch TV. He said, it looks like everything's clear because it's so big, but you need to wear the glasses. So I said, okay, I will start wearing the glasses. And as I did that, 
things started to normalize. Now I can go up and down the stairs with no problem. <laughs> now I don't get bothered by the reflections at nighttime or in the rain or anything like that. Why? I have grown accustomed. I have adjusted. And in Acts 2.42, it says this, and they devoted themselves to, say la, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. They devoted themselves to, and they devoted themselves to this new and very different paradigm. They didn't give up on it. They didn't bail out. They didn't say it's not like we're used to doing it. This is different and we don't like it. They devoted themselves to it. Another way to say that is they were committed to the new vision God had given them. And that vision was that they would be committed to the Messiah and his kingdom above all else. And it was a new paradigm for them. But they embraced it. And they were devoted to it. You see, because the end goal of commitment in this context and in our context, I'm going to give you three words that we're not used to. But they're good words. One is orthodoxy. And that just simply means right belief. And the Second one is orthopraxy, which is right actions. And then the third one is orthopathy, which is right affections of our heart. And all three of those, listen to me, are an absolute necessity for a believer in the Lord. Could you imagine that I have right beliefs, but my actions speak something else. No good, right? And what if I have the right beliefs and I have the right actions, but every time I do something in my heart, the attitude is stinky? Well, that's no good either. God is looking for us to have all three of those things in line. Right beliefs, right actions, and right affections. Well, this was the end goal of the people in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to this new paradigm. The new teaching, the new way of doing things. And it should be our end goal as well. And a matter of fact, when God does something new, see, we think God just does things for us and to us. No, wrong. He does things with us. So if you resist God all the time when he's wanting to do a new thing in your life, eventually, listen, God's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself upon you. You must. No. God says, come on. And if you keep resisting, he'll say, all right, maybe you're not ready. And he'll let us go do our own thing. He'll let us stay with the blurry glasses, so to speak. And he'll let us just struggle. Not because he wants us to struggle, P.S., but if we're unwilling to devote ourselves to this new thing, commit ourselves, guess what? God says, okay, I'll back off a little bit. But I want to encourage you today not to resist God in the new things he wants to do. So let's talk about how do you help your eyes adjust to new glasses. Well, first of all, what I learned is I had to wear them. <laughs> it's simple, right? I just had to wear them. And I had to struggle through some of those uncomfortable moments. The best thing you can do to help your eyes and your brain adjust to new glasses is to wear them, put them on, and wear them as soon as you get up, since that's when your eyes are fresh. Wear them as much as possible during the day. Don't wait to put them on later in the day because that shock can cause those ill effects to, to kick in. Don't switch back and forth with an old pair. I did that all the time because I was a little cheap. When I get the new prescriptions, I would use the old pair when I was now doing knockabout stuff outside because I didn't want to damage the new lenses. 
that I always put the old pair on. I always have the old pair on. And going from the old pair to the new pair. And you can, you can tell, your eyes get... Mm. And even though it's tempting to go back and forth and to move back into those old ways, you have to keep the end goal in mind and be committed to it. Look what Hebrews says. And I want to say this over you. I'm sure that this won't happen to you, friends. I have better things in mind for you, salvation things, God speaking. God doesn't miss anything. He knows perfectly well all the love you've shown him by helping the needy among the Messianic community and that you keep at it. And now I want each of you to extend, extend that same intensity toward a full-bodied hope and keep it until the finish. Don't drag your feet, Selah. Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith. Get that in your head. Stay the course with committed faith. Stay the course with committed faith. And then get everything promised to them. I want to show you a commercial clip. Rolex footage. <laughs> Okay, you have to turn the, the volume up. Gonna have to roll that again. It's the two, so it's on the, where, the, uh, where you find the uh, sound for the um, music for the tape player. The two sliders to the right of that. Is the computer plugged in? Is the sound plugged yes, in? just got reinstated. Can you start it again? Well, not Thanks. officially. Can you start that again? Nervous. Can you start again? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Have you ever worked for Dr. Francis? Oh, yeah. He's okay. Just okay? Guess who just got reinstated? Well, not officially. Nervous? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. I'll see you in there. Just okay is not okay, especially when it comes to your network. AT&T is America's best wireless network according to America's biggest test. Now with 5G Evolution, the first step to 5G. More for your thing. It's just okay, right? Imagine if the doctor did that. Yeah, it's, just, it's all right. You know I'm nervous. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, we do that with God sometimes. God wants to take us to new things, and we just want to say, oh, it's okay if I stay here. It's okay if I live my life a little sloppy. It's okay. The truth is, it's, it's not okay, really. If you are representing God, it's not okay just to do whatever you want. Be, just like that, do you think it's okay for that doctor? Absolutely not okay. And it's absolutely not okay for representatives of the king of kings to do whatever they want. It's not okay. And so... The next thing we must do if we're going to success, be successful in walking out our new 2020 vision is we must be consistent. Listen to me, right here, Rabbi Carroll and myself love you guys, and that's why we are willing to say some things that are a little more challenging, because I could just stand up here and I could feed you candy. I could just throw you candy all day. And you'll love it. Who doesn't like a nice uh, peanut butter cup? I could just start throwing you those peanut butter cups, man. You could just be <laughs> rabbi. Let's keep it coming. I love going to shoe. He just throws those peanut butter cups out all day long. But let me tell you something. You wouldn't do that with your kids, would you? Yeah, you might give them one or two. But you're not going to be feeding them no peanut butter cups because you know they need some nourishment. So, yeah, broccoli is on the agenda sometimes and protein. Like, who likes protein, really? Give me rice and pasta and I'm happy. You know, but we don't do that. And in the same way, we need to give you some things that are going to provoke you to grow. And so let's talk about consistency. Getting new glasses can be exciting. <laughs> and this is how they're exciting, you know, when you get the new frames. <laughs> it's the only thing about glasses that's exciting. Hey, maybe I get a new frame, different look. However, we need to remember that you may need to go through that adjustment period like we talked about in order to be successful. And you have to be committed. 
and you have to be consistent um, for it to take place. So if we're talking about natural vision, I would say wear your glasses consistently. You may be tempted to take them off, like we said, but don't. Keep them on. You may forget to put them on, but when you remember, make sure you get them on your head. If you need reading glasses in certain situations, be sure to have them around, right? So you don't strain your eyes and, you know, do the trombone thing, right, with, uh, with your, your Bible. And especially, by the way, on iPhones, I don't know about you, a pretty small print, right? And, you know, when you make it bigger, it's hard to navigate. And so if you need the glasses, put them on. If you need corrected vision all the time, be sure, sure to wear your glasses every day. And if you do this consistently, you will be successful in transitioning from blurry vision to 2020 vision. Nice, clear vision. Isn't that great? Isn't that great to have nice, clear vision? I love it. Although, you know, I'm not in love with the idea of wearing glasses. Every time I go like this in the morning, because right now I can't see it so well, but in the morning when I do this, I go into my glass case and I go like this, ah, ah that's what everything is like, that's great. I can read that now. Um, it makes sense. And remember that consistency leads to constancy. Consistency leads to constancy. And if we're consistent, we will end up becoming unwavering in our love and loyalty to the Lord and his purposes. Consistency leads to constancy. And that's where we want to end up, where we are fully committed and devoted to the things of God. So I'm going to, I have several questions which are all different yet share the same answer. Let's go through them real quickly. What will guard against foolish extremes? Consistency. What characterizes those who are habitually successful in sports, sales, or whatever skill? Consistency. What single quality in a business builds respect deeper than any other? Consistency. What brings security in relationships? Consistency. What makes us choose a particular brand name over all others? Consistency. What's needed most by parents in the home? Consistency. What draws you to the same restaurant time and again? Consistency. What do you want most from your electricity provider or postman or internet provider? Consistency. Do you hear me yet? Gets old. Right? You want consistency. What will add more weight to your witness for Messiah than anything else is consistency. So, consistency and transition are hard. Yes. So what can we do to be more consistent in our lives, and in particular, concerning our spiritual lives? And before I get into that, I want to encourage that there is nothing more important. Hear me on this. There is nothing, I say this all the time in my family, there is nothing more important in, the, in your life or in the world than our spiritual well-being and our relationship with God, period. So if there is nothing more important to that, and I'll prove it to you in a second from Scripture, if there is nothing more important in the whole entire universe than that, then why are your priorities like they are? So I don't know your priorities. So, <laughs> you, 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 so why are your priorities what they are? Let me say this. Yeshua said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now listen, for some of us in this room, we're doing the right things. Baruch Hashem, keep doing it. And that's no doubt true. For others, we might need to make an adjustment. 
So let's look at that for a second. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? What will it profit a man if he has more fun? What will it profit a man if he takes more rest? If he secures more finances? Matter of fact, put whatever you want in that statement, and that statement still remains true. What good is it if you do all of those things and neglect your soul, the condition of your soul? What good is it? What do you get to heaven and say, what? God, um, I made top 10 in the company. And God says what? And not that it's wrong to make top 10, P.S., but certainly not at the expense of your soul. And those spiritual disciplines that are very, very, very important. This verse tells us that there is nothing in the entire world that is more important than our spiritual well-being. And the way we make sure we are spiritually healthy is by being in process. Everything, by the way, has a process. If you want a tree, you plant a seed, right? And the seed germinates, it's watered, and slowly it begins to grow. Little by little, it stretches skyward toward the sun, and after many years, a full-grown tree appears. Well, uh, that's not the end of the story, because that full-grown tree will, after many years of spreading its roots deep and far and wide in the ground, will become a mature, stable, healthy tree. It doesn't start out that way. It is only through the process that it becomes that way. Believers are funny. We're funny people as believers, because we go to God and say, God, I want to be that. And God says, cool. You want to be a doctor? Great. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get you to med school. And you're going to start to learn about being a doctor. And I'll be with you. And my spirit will help you to learn everything you need to learn. And after 10 to 12 years, you'll be a doctor. And we go, whoa, 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 whoa. I liked everything you said, God, except... The 10 to, 12, the 10 to 12, what? And how much money? What, what, what? You see, we want the end results, but we don't want the process. The process is where it happens. The tree goes from immature to mature through the process. And I want to tell you that so many people, matter of fact, too many people get out of the process. God has him on the, the four-lane highway of process to his purposes. And what they say is this, you know what? I'm getting off the exit ramp. I'm taking a break from this process. And I'm going to get off. And they get off, and they stall their progress. I want to encourage you to get back on. Get on the entrance ramp and head down the highway that God has planned for your life. It's a great plan that God has, but here's one thing God cannot do. Can, God cannot and will not do it for us. He will only do it with us. Amen. If I only use my glasses occasionally, it ain't gonna work. And it's gonna be frustrating in the times. Matter of fact, I don't want to be without my glasses when I'm doing my finances. Funny things will happen. I might see an extra zero or two. Or write an extra zero or two. That wouldn't be good, would it? The same is true spiritually. We don't want to be taking off ramps when God has us on a set path. 1 Corinthians 9, I want us to look here. Great verse. It says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. What does that tell us for a second? It tells us this, 
that oh, we could all be in this quote-unquote race in the kingdom of God, but not everyone's running the same. Not everyone's running to actually get to the finish line. Some people are just, you know, running around. Doing all sorts of crazy things, maybe. But not everyone is running the same. That's what it said. But it's telling us to run like you want to win. Run like you want to get the prize. Finish the goal. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, yet they do not receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let me read you another version of the same thing. In a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets first prize. So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourselves. Here, here, here's the grown-up food right now. Ready? To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things. Really? <laughs> to win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup, but we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. That's the good news. So I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win, says Rav Shaul. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should do. Not what it wants to. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> what it should do. Not what it wants to do. Hmm. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might be declared unfit and ordered to stand aside. That's pretty potent. That's a potent verse, if you reflect on it for a second. Now I want to give you a third translation of that latter half of that verse, and it says this. This is the message. And it says, I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition, spiritually speaking. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it and then missing out myself. What is that telling us, that verse? That verse is telling us that there is a right way to go about this thing that we call faith and living in the kingdom of God and kingdom life and the new vision that God has for us. There's a way to do it that's right, that gets to the goal, that gets the promise, and there's a way to do it that looks like you're just doing something, but you're not being effective. So the question is, how are you living your life? Remember, consistency leads to constancy, and constancy, along with discipline, brings the desired results in our lives. That's just the way it is. I wish it were different. I wish I could just go like this. Bless them. And what happened in your life? Everything that God has for you would just happen. That would make my job so easy. It would be so easy. If I could just pronounce a blessing, and you would leave here, and you would go and do everything you need to do and pop out the other end with all that God has for you. If I could do it, friends, I would do it in a heartbeat. But the point is, I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. Only as we each individually cooperate with God does it happen. Guys, like anything, have you any, who in this room has trained someone 
in anything. You train someone, do a job, a task, supervise, right? And you see them doing something, and they're not doing it correctly. What do you do? You just leave them go? No, because you know if they keep doing it incorrectly, there's going to be an inferior result. Matter of fact, in some cases, it might be a result that totally misses the mark completely. So what do you do? You stop them, you retrain them, and say, no, 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 this is the way to do it, and this is the way to get results. How many people, why do we, I mean, why do we spend so much time doing this? Both here and at home, in our everyday life, we spend a lot of time doing this, and do we want to do it for nothing? Or do we want to do it effectively? Of course, effectively. So let's do it. The last thing I want to touch upon as we consider living with our new vision is cleanliness. And I want to tell you, this is my problem. Oh, now I wear my glasses. But sometimes I can't see through my glasses. And then I'll go like this. And I'll say, holy cow. <laughs> There's like three films of dirt and dust all over the glasses. And it is amazing. I'll suffer with those dirty glasses, struggling to read, and I'll start thinking, gee, maybe my prescription changed. <laughs> maybe I need to get a new pair. And then I go to the sink, a little water, wash it off with soap. Ah, miracle. I could see again. Cleanliness is important when it comes to glasses. And I, and I want to tell you, it behooves you to keep them clean, but it also is important as it pertains to our spiritual life. Two Corinthians seven says this. Listen to me. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. If we want to reap the benefits of the vision that God has for our lives, which is, like I said, is a great one, great, we must ha live clean lives. Or in other words, we must be holy. Holy living is required. And here's why. Because sin will alter your spiritual vision. And if your vision is altered, it will lead you off course. That is why you can talk to someone who is living in blatant sin. And when you tell them, you confront them, they don't see it. And they have a million and one ways how to justify it. And I can tell you, after almost 30 years of ministry, almost everyone I've ever encountered and confronted said to say, keeps going the way they're going. Why is that? Because they're bad people? Absolutely not. Why is that? Because sin is deceptive. Sin's deceptive. It deceives us. So when you're deceived, you think, hey, no, 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 Rabbi, everything's good. Everything's good. No, 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 I'm not, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to, 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 to live with someone outside of it. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. We're doing it for convenience. It's, trust me, it's good. It's good. Uh, no, it's not good. <laughs> no, it's spiritually dangerous. Uh, don't do that. No, 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 Rabbi. You, you, don't, you got it all wrong. It's, it's okay. It's okay. See? They think that it's really okay. Why? Sin is deceptive. That's huge, guys. This is, this is grown-up food. <laughs> Sin is deceptive, not your friend. It will lead you off course. You see, their vision has become blurry, and they cannot see what they used to see. The life of holiness, or right and wrong, used to be crystal clear to them. Now they have been tainted by sin and cannot see what they used to see clearly. And this is not a good state to be in, and I've, like I said, confronted many people, and I can't say that I've had a lot of success. 
convincing them because they're thoroughly convinced, thoroughly, that it's all good. Listen to this. Hebrews 3 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And why is this important? Because the scripture clearly says, just a few chapters down the road from Hebrews 3, is Hebrews 12, and it says this, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Friends, I'm going to stop right there. I want everyone in this room to see the Lord <laughs> on that day. Everyone. And guess what? Without holiness, not my words, Bible words, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esav, who sold his birthright, birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is why the parable that Yeshua tells, it says, remember the, the, uh, the virgins, right? Five were ready, five weren't, right? And it says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They want to get in. They want to repent. Esther wanted that blessing. You remember, we just read it. It was in the Parsha. Father, is there not a blessing for me too? Father, there, there has to be something, something left. Boy, he, you could read, when you read that text, you could sense how distraught Esav is. And the father, what did he say? He said, I gave the blessing to your brother. All right. That's why, friends, this is so important. Remember, the end game is to finish the race. That's the end game, right? To finish, not to start. How many people started a new diet? <laughs> Come on. How many people, you started a new thing? I'm going to learn this this year. We know it because every year everyone starts Hebrew. Class is full. By the end of the year, class is empty. <laughs> Why? Because this is what you do. Do I want to learn Hebrew? Absolutely. But you mean I actually have to learn it? I have to study it? I have to read it? Every day? Oh, maybe not so much. See, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. That's what really matters. And so to do that, we need to walk in holiness, like I said, because sin alters our vision and will cause us to miss the mark. Guys, you want to miss the mark? Go through all this and miss the mark? And here's, let me give you some keys to holy living. First one. Staying connected to God through spiritual disciplines. Close your eyes and ask yourself as I read it, is this me or not? For some of us, it's not us. For some, it is. If you are a person who regularly neglects spiritual disciplines, like reading the word, prayer, worship, and fellowship, you are in danger of veering off course. And you are susceptible to deception. Don't be deceived even if you are convinced that all is okay. Without regular spiritual activity, you're on a slippery slope. And that is why fellowship and community is so important, so people can challenge your life, just like I'm doing now. Listen, for some of you, you're angry at me right now. You're saying, that rabbi, man, let me tell you, he's got some knife. 
Say it like a Long Islander. You got some nerve talking to me like that. Well, perhaps that's true. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Um, that's what community is about. Putting yourself in a situation to be challenged. Because guess what? If you go home, you're four and no more. You could be living and some... Trust me, folks, this happens. Sometimes, every once in a great while, you get folks that blow in here. Where you been? Where you coming from? The congregation down the road, another state? Oh, no, no, we just have it in our house. Oh, that's, 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 that's cool. And then you, as you get to know them, there's all sorts of strange things and doctrines and beliefs and teachings and... This, because no one was in their life to say, hey, no, that ain't right. No, you can't have two wives, bro. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't be, there's some wrong things with what you're doing. You need to amend your ways. The word of God says something different. You know what I'm saying? Accountability and community is really, really important. You have to be in the race to win it, and some, like I said, have chosen to take the exit ramp, and you're not on course today. And if that's you, I encourage you to get back in, get on the entrance ramp so that you could see the road ahead that God has laid out for you and your family, and to run strong. Secondly, right, if we're going to live a holy life, we need to have the mind of Messiah. Not your mind, <laughs> the mind of Messiah. Not my mind. The mind of Messiah. Look what it says. There's a quote from John Brown. He said, Holiness does not consist in mystic speculations, enthusiastic fervors, or uncommanded austerities. It consists in thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. That's what it's about. Thinking like God's think, God thinks. How does he think? He says it in the word. What does he will? It says it in the word. That's holiness, having the mind of Messiah, doing what he wants us to do, how he wants us to do it. The next thing is to trust in God, which is evidenced by obedience. Friend, do you think you're going to make it to the end of the line, which God wants you to make it to the end of the line? Listen, God's at the other end. God is the greatest cheerleader in the world. Friend, if it wasn't for God, I was so off the mark in my life I wasn't even near the road, friends. I was in some backwood hill country <laughs> without, a, without a compass. No hope. And God somehow, some way, got me to the road and said, my son, get on. And has cheered me on ever since because he's our greatest cheerleader. But with that said, we need to obey God. <laughs> Right? If God says, hey, take this way, and we don't do it, whose fault is that? God's fault? No. Kepha Aleph 122 says, having purified your souls by your obedience. Purified your souls. Holiness. How does holiness happen? By obedience. Holiness and obedience go hand in hand. Oh, well, Rabbi, I'm holy, but I don't obey anything God says. I don't obey any of the word. Not holy. <laughs> By holiness and obedience go hand in hand. Then it goes on to say, for the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Can I just tell you, can I just be frank? I want to be real with you. <laughs> I've had my head in, in the history of the Kehillah for many months now, reading and probably read 16 books in the past three months. And if all I could say is after the end of it, I say, oh, are you? <laughs> what a mess the body of Messiah has been in. Discord, jealousy, hatred, strife, division. What a mess. What, an, what a mess. 
no love, no grace, no mercy, just if you're not doing it my way, it's that wrong. That the, all the, from after Yeshua till today, not a great, great thing. And if I was an immature believer, I might be discouraged by it. But I know God is not the issue. It's us getting with the program of God, being obedient, walking. Here's a new word. Let's, let's learn this word. Ready? Love. Love covers, covers, covers. A multitude of sins. The last one, and then we're closing, is this. I'm going to look at you right square in the eye and say, take control of your life. Take control of your life. Ephesians 4, 24 says, put on the new self. Not God to do it for you. It says you. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. No, don't wait for God to do it. It says you do it. God did everything he could ever do for you already. He hung on a tree in agonizing pain. Why? Because he had nothing better to do? No, because he loved you so much that he was willing to do that for you. And now what he asks of us, he says, you, put on your new self. Don't put it off. Don't blame someone else. You put on the new self. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Holiness. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, <laughs> joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God. Where you see righteousness, peace, and joy, that's the kingdom. And easy strife, division, and all, and all this, that's not the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy is what God's kingdom is like. So, is there something, this is something we do with the help of the Ruach HaKodesh. First Thessalonians says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. You see, at the end of the day, if we are truly living for God and not for the world, then we will live holy lives as it is written. Kepha Beth 3 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved. Everything you see, everything in your life, every building, every car, every material blessing you have is going to be dissolved. What sort of people, with that being true, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and goodness, godliness? That's how we need to live, holiness and godliness. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you're living for other things that are going to burn, God is directing you to put them off. Friends, God has a crystal clear, pristine vision for your life. It's awesome. Don't blurry it up. Stay the course. Run the race. Live a holy life. Put sin away and allow God to do something absolutely beautiful in your life. In conclusion, if we want to live and enjoy the 2020 vision that God richly gives, then we must be committed to the vision that God has given. We must be consistent through the process, and we must maintain that vision through cleanliness of heart and spirit. So, listen, that's what I have for you today. I know that I know that I know that 
for everyone in this room, there is a wonderful plan, a great vision, but God is handicapped, not in his lack of power, not in his lack of desire, but in our unwillingness to cooperate. So this is my exhortation to you. As your rabbi who loves you, I want to see everyone thriving in God, every family. But it happens as we make some good decisions with our life. Make some good decisions in how we spend our time. Good decisions in what we invest in. When we do it, good things happen. When we neglect it, weeds grow. You know, in the spring, we love planting. But you know, in the dog days of summer, when those weeds are going, when you have to get back there and we'll weed them all out. See, those weeds, they just keep growing and growing. They've got to be maintained. So God is asking you, will you maintain your life in a way that's going to get you to the end goal? Righteousness, peace. But I tell you, that's what the whole world wants anyway. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. I'm going to ask the prayer team, whoever's here, to come up. And if you have, after we're done praying, I'm going to pray you'll be released to go. But listen to me. If you're here and you have a need, why leave? Go get prayer. Take another 10 minutes and get prayer so someone can believe with you for whatever's going on in your life. So if you need prayer, if there's something going on, please come up. We need some folks to come up <laughs> in the leadership team to, uh, to pray. I'm going to pray for us for the message. Just bow your hearts. and Father, I pray for each one. Lord, these, your precious people. Lord, these, your children, your sons and your daughters, God. Lord, that you love beyond measure. Father, I pray for each one. Father, that each one of, Lord, these precious of yours, God, would not be deceived, would not be, Lord, um, taken off course in any way, shape, or form, God, that they would not, Lord, fall prey to the tactics of darkness. But, Father, they would stay firmly planted, Lord God, on the course of, Lord, that you have set for them, Lord, that will result in a blessed and good life. Father, that they would be filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. God, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. Lord, that the healing virtue of Messiah would ebb into every fiber of their being. God, that their minds would be filled with goodly thoughts. God, that they would be filled with faith, O oh God. Father, that they would, Lord, not need, Lord God, your constant encouragement but Lord instead they would be an encouragement to others because they're walking in the fullness of your Ruach so Father I speak that over each one over each family God we plead your blessing Father that you would truly do exceedingly abundantly above all that they ask or imagine Hashem Yeshua let's stand I'll dismiss you again if you need prayer though don't be dismissed. If you need prayer, come up and make sure you get prayer. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father, I pray, Lord, your peace that surpasses understanding. Bless your people with it. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom if you need to go. Uh, but if you need prayer, please come and get prayer. <laughs>